So I want to talk about the ways that Elijah is a obvious predictor and prophetic type of Christ. Typology has a clear apologetic significance in that it's also kind of like prophecies, a way of fulfilling predictions. The types are a little bit different because they're more symbolic than an outright word that predicts, say, Daniel 7, Daniel 9, you know, the time of the Messiah. So in the, when we look at the appearance of Elijah in 3 Kings, or 1 Kings 19, 17 to 19, excuse me, what we see is a prophet who's persecuted by his people. And Jesus fulfills this symbol and image of Elijah because Jesus was rejected by his people. This is mentioned actually in Luke 4, 23 to 27, where Jesus talks about the fact that Elijah went to the widow of Zarephath and and to uh, Naaman the Syrian and did not minister to most of the people in Israel. And this enraged the people in the synagogue in Luke 4 because of their pride, right? They thought that God should have come to them first. But just like in those times, Jesus is coming, Elijah is coming to the people and they're rejecting him. This is also why Elijah is a type of John the Baptist. And Jesus says this earlier in Luke as well, that Elijah was, John the Baptist was to come to prepare the way for the Messiah. He comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, just as Elisha came in the spirit and power of Elijah. So the first thing that we noticed is the miracles. Jesus is present in nature and Jesus is also transcendent above nature because he's not just human, he's also divine. He's the son of God with human nature. And so uh, the widow of Zarephath that he goes to after he's being fed by the ravens, we're speaking of Elijah here, um, this miracle shows us that God has the ability to provide for us even if the situation seems dire or that we're stuck in necessity and that we can't get out of it. Um, God will always provide for us no matter what. So we see God's providence there. And the widow of Zarephath has a sick son. And so what happens is that she feeds, she gives Elijah a cup of cold water when he asks for it, and this honors him as the one of the last true prophets left who did not bow the knee to Baal, right? We know that there were 7,000 who did not bow the knee to Baal. And this is mentioned in Matthew 14, 18, where Jesus talks about anyone who gives a prophet even a cup of cold water in the name of God will not lose his reward. And in this case, Elijah rewards the widow of Zarephath by miraculously raising her spirit. Uh, her son from the dead and so what does he do he lays on top of him it would look like perhaps cruciform three times so we get this triadic three times imagery and this of course raises him from the dead so this is similar to again miracles of resurrection that jesus does jesus raises the dead and if we believe that elijah did what elijah did then it's not any more difficult for christ to do what he did because he's the one who did the miracles through elijah we also see the bread miracle, right? The Eucharist. So Elijah uh, multiplies the widow's food when she's out of food. She's poor. And so Elijah miraculously feeds her during this time of famine. Israel is under a period of cursing because of uh, Ahab and Jezebel. They've rejected God, and so they're under the covenant curses of Deuteronomy 28, where famine, pestilence, drought has come. And so God is miraculously providing for Elijah and those and the widow and those who believe in him. So her sixth son is laid out, um, and there's it's mentioned that he does this three times. This suggests the three days right of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Obvious uh, typology in verses 21 to 22. Elijah is accused of being the cause of trouble, just as Jesus is accused of being the troublemaker. When in fact. It's the elite and the power establishment that are the cause of the trouble. They have been Jezebel, not the prophets. So the 400 prophets of Baal, all of the prophets of Israel have been converted over to being prophets of Baal. Uh, and in, in a way similar to the oddities that we see in like Roman Catholic medieval flagellants where they whip themselves, the prophets of Baal cut themselves in order to have this spiritual battle with Elijah. So when Elijah is battling them on the mountain. Uh, they cut themselves. They call upon Baal. Elijah makes fun of them. He makes jokes and he says, is your God going putty? Is he putting the pee-pee in the poo-poo? Where is your God? If your God is summoned by these self-immolation, self-harm rituals, then you would think you would have the power to bring him forth, but he doesn't show up. And instead, uh, Elijah does the miracle where he uh, builds an altar 
and he pours water around it three times, and then the fire of God comes down, and we so we see a theophany. So once again, in the in the case of Elijah, miracles are transcend that nature is transcended in the miraculous, and all that means is that it's God doing what he does in nature in a different way. So it's not that nature is natural, and then the supernatural is just some rare occurrence of God. Actually, all of nature is supernatural. And a miracle is God doing something that he normally does through providence and nature in a different way. So it's, there's not, it's nothing out of the ordinary if you view it from that perspective. And so he does this three times in this case as well. So we see the triadic principle here again. Three times is symbolic. And so we have a standoff between the true God uh, whose worship requires humility uh, over against the prelest and pride in the worship of the prophets of Baal who cut themselves and act like medieval Roman Catholic weirdos. Now, God answers by fire. As we saw in Hebrews, we see that God is an all-consuming fire. This is a theophany. This is an energetic manifestation of God within time and space coming down uh, and burning up the offering on the altar that Elijah built. And so this signifies that Elijah has the true God. He lays out 12 stones, represented 12 tribes of Israel, just like the high priest has the 12 tribes on his breastplate. So fire and water become in harmony, and again, that's because God can transcend, <coughs> transcend nature. Um, and we shouldn't even think that this is that out, outrageous, because James even cites this instance of Elijah, uh, where Elijah was able to pray and open up the heavens, and God brought rain. Right? And we really do have the ability through intercessory prayer to do what is above nature. That's the whole ethos of theosis and orthodoxy. Then we see that um, the angel of the Lord appears. This is very important because this is one of the theophanies that in my long talk on theophanies I didn't cover. We see that the angel of the Lord appears and he taps Elijah on the shoulder when Elijah's hiding out from the persecution of Ahab. And he's told to arise and eat. And after this arising and eating, he goes for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. For a journey, he goes on a journey. This is exactly what Jesus does at the beginning of his ministry. He begins his ministry with a fast, 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Moses and the Israelites wandered for 40 days or for 40 years in the wilderness. So there's this recurring symbolic pattern of the 40 days, 40 nights as this kind of preparation period, this exile period, and then there's a restoration. When the Logos appears, it is Christ who's talking here. And and we know that because Elijah says it is the voice of God. And in the Orthodox study Bible, uh, I think in one of the verses, the voice might even be capitalized, right? And so as it moves on to explain, God says, I will speak to you, but I'm not in the wind, I'm not in the earthquake, and I'm not in the fire. So this means the principles and power in nature, God is not identified with them. This is a treatise against idolatry. This is a, cre a treatise against um, the analogia entis, that the essence of God is like created things. It's not. The energies and power of God are like created things, but not the essence of God. And that's why God explains to Elijah that you won't hear me and find me in the, in the, the fire and in the earthquake and in the mountain and in the principles of nature. He says, you will find me in a still small voice, some texts say, right? That's the apophatic theology that we have in orthodoxy. God is not like, in his essence, in his nature, anything created. He's radically unlike created things in his essence. And so uh, we see that the Spirit of God is present here. There's a triadic principle here in this chapter, um, 19, uh, 11, uh, 7 through 11. Uh, we see this principle, the whole, the, the three persons of God are present. And we have the idea as well that authority still comes from God, even for civil rulers. In fact, in a mysterious way, he's even told to go anoint the king of Syria. God says to Elijah, go anoint Hazael, the king of Syria. But Israel was God's nation. Yes, but you see, all throughout the Old Testament, even amongst the pagan nations, the only people who are in power are in power by God's providence. And in this case, this weird, unique case, Elijah was told to anoint the king of Syria, as well as obviously the king of Israel. And this is a foreshadowing of the calling of the Gentiles, just like Naaman the Syrian being baptized. This happens with Elisha, not with Elijah, but when Naaman the Syrian comes to Elisha, 
Elisha tells him to go and be baptized in the water. And dunk yourself in the Jordan seven times, right? And he can't believe this, right? He's like, what? That's a type of baptism, right? This is what, and where does John the Baptist baptize? In the Jordan. Just like Naaman the Syrian washes in the Jordan River. And he's cured of his, his leprosy. In the same way, we're cured of the leprosy of sin through baptism. So, next we see when Elijah gets distressed and he feels alone and he feels like he's the only one left. God tells him and encourages him and says that there are uh, 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And the food that, that God gave him, just like the manna in the wilderness, it was almost like the limbus bread. Mr. Frodo! Mr. Frodo! It's a limbus bread, Mr. Frodo! It sustains him for 40 days and for 40 nights. It's like the Eucharist. Just like when Moses was on the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights, eating with God, right? When Moses ascends the mountain to get the law, how did he survive? when he was up there with no food for four days. Well, it says he ate with God. So God fed him in a miraculous way. God fed the Israelites, the man in the wilderness. God feeds us the Eucharist. It's all the same mystery being taught to us over and over and over. So uh, next we want to point out that the angel of the Lord, again, is the Logos. It is the second person of the Godhead. It's the voice and the word, the still small voice that's present here in 1913 and 1907. Next we see the story of Naboth, who is taken outside of the city and killed for his vineyard. This is exactly what we're taught in the parable of the vineyard. Naboth is a type of Christ. He's a righteous man who's persecuted and uh, uh, Ahab steals his vineyard at the request of Jezebel. In the same way, in the parable of the vine keeper, uh, the vine wicked vine dressers, Jesus is likening himself to Naboth. This is fulfilled in the death of Christ. Christ is killed outside the city, Hebrews says. Just like Naboth was. And he's also killed at the behest of false witnesses. The death of Naboth happens because false witnesses make up lies about him. In the crucifixion of Christ, they lie about him and you know they free Barabbas. So what we see is a type, uh, Ahab and Jezebel are a type of apostate Israel, which is fulfilled in 70 AD. So again, the same patterns of apostasy, persecution of the righteous, prophets, uh, under Elijah and Elisha is mirrored and fulfilled in the time of Christ. The ultimate point when Jesus says everything that is written in the law and prophets must be fulfilled. He's talking about in his com first coming at 70 AD when the temple and uh, the ministry is destroyed by Titus and Vespasian when the Romans invade and destroy it. So I just want to point these out that the, the whore, Jezebel, is a clear type if you read the Apocalypse, especially 13, 14, 17, and 18 of John's Apocalypse, where we see the typology of the whore and the bride, Christ and his bride, and they're being persecuted by the apostate whore. That's all fulfilled in 70 AD. That's what Luke 21 and Matthew 24 are talking about. And it's exactly the same as the day of Elijah. And when we understand these patterns, we start to see how amazing God's word is in terms of fulfillment within history. And so not only are there specific prophecies about the death, birth of Messiah and so forth, all these types are prophecies and predictions of Jesus who fulfills all of them. Which again is a strong testament to the inspiration of scriptures. This is not just humans inventing patterns in history. That's impossible. Over and over and over, they're fulfillments and it shows the supernatural character and inspiration of scripture. This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. Thank you for listening to my talk on the uh, ways that Elijah is a type of Jesus. Again, very powerful. Subscribe to Jay's Analysis at the links at my website. Down below, also subscribe to this YouTube channel. Click all the bells and the clicky cookies and the clickety clackies to get the updates and also get my book, Esther Collier 1 and 2. Sign copies in the shop at Jay's Analysis. Thank you. If you like this analysis, be sure to click subscribe. And give me a thumbs up down below. Also, be sure to check out Jay's analysis uh, and definitely click the bell down below to be sure you get the updates.